run out. Y'all, y'all were about in the spirit last night. We almost had folks running in this place. But uh, Greg told me, he said, I'm not going to preach that long. I said, brother, you go until the spirit tells you to stop. That's what we desire here at Pleasant Hill. Well, what I need you to do right now is just stand up, greet one another, tell each other you're glad to see one another in the house of the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is our prayer, Heavenly Father, that you would speak uh, through your servants this evening, both in uh, the message of song and also the proclamation. Uh, Father, we pray that you would hide both of your servants behind the cross, that what we would see is Jesus tonight. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Mr. Allen. Well, we're going to have some great singing tonight, and we're going to have some great preaching. And I hope that you will not let Brother Bill down with your congregational singing tonight. So I want you to pretend like you're twice the person you are. I don't have a problem with that personally. I used to introduce myself as I'm Alan Harris. I'm twice the man I used to be. And that's kind of the way it was. No, I'm, how did I say it? I was, um, I hadn't had much sleep, y'all. So I can't even think of what I'm doing right now. Let's stand together and sing, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus? Come on, let's pick it up. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Now lay aside the garments. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you spotless, spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? The blood that Jesus shed for me. Back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest, it reaches to the highest mountain. It glows. 
so much you did good brother guy come up here and he's going to sing one of my favorite all-time favorite songs mine too alan written by mr gordon jensen have we got any volume yet short here, don't I? All right, now here. It's scary when you're the out of, <laughs> this is the only music you're going to have. In letters of crimson, God wrote his love on a hillside so long ago. There for you and for me Jesus died and love's greatest story was told I love you I love you that's what Calvary same hands that suffered and bled. He kept giving all he had to give in a message so easily I grow up, I want to sing just like him. <laughs> I do. I, I told him earlier, I said, my only desire in life that I never fulfilled as a young boy growing up was to be on the Lawrence Welk show. I'll, and I used to watch, well, 
I wasn't that young, but I used to watch Guy on there. What, a, what an inspiration he was in our lives. Thank you so much for sharing with us. He's going to come back and share another great song in just a moment. Before we have our offertory prayer and our offertory this evening, let's stand once again. And we're going to sing a couple of old classic favorites about the cross. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not what to be defied, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. burden soul and liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span on Calvary. See, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love that old cross, where the fear is and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain, so I'll change At last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And all the love cross, I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear, then he'll call me someday to my home.
can never sing that hymn without going back to the first year of my ministry in Vine Grove, Kentucky. As I was getting ready to preach, we were singing that hymn. And I looked out and there was Miriam Brown who had suffered a stroke. She had to have a little cane to walk and make her way up to the uh, pew. And she couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. But boy, she was singing that old rugged cross. And I remember that night as she came out the door, she said, Pastor, this has been one of the most beautiful days that I've ever experienced. And I said, well, Marion, I wish everybody would sing like you. And that night, around midnight, Marion exchanged that old rugged cross for a crown. And every time, I get so emotional when I sing that song because I think of Marion Brown who went on to be with the Lord, but she sang it like it was her last time. You never know about life. We're getting ready to take up a love offering. Love offering that you give goes to every one of these men. You know what I've done after every service? I've said, I'm sending you a check. And they look at me and they say, right. And no, really I am. But we collect this whole thing and we divide it out. And these, these guys have just, I mean, Greg is driven here from Brookhaven. You know, those guys were here from Jackson last night. Uh, Dr. Smith rented a car, drove from Birmingham, and a teach this morning. Have you been blessed this week? Give like you've been blessed. Give like you have been blessed, and the Lord will bless you. Father, we're thankful that we can show our appreciation in such a way that we can invest in ministries, we can invest in in individuals' lives, and thus be a part of eternity. For we don't know what message Brother Warnock will preach this Sunday, but we're investing in him. And he will preach the word of God, and somebody's heart may be touched who accepts you. And we've had an investment in that. And likewise, as Guy sings with his quartet and sings solos, we never know how that music is going to touch a soul, a soul like the old rugged cross touches mine. And it will touch it in such a way that they will be moved to follow you as Savior and Lord. So help us to invest not only in these ministries, these lives, but invest in eternity. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. It's a song written by Dallas Home that I've been singing probably 40 years. I think it's still my favorite of all the Easter songs as we celebrate our risen Christ. Go ahead, drive those nails in my hand and laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead, say it isn't me. The day will come when you will see. Cause I'll run. And tie me down. Yes, I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in the ground. Go ahead, go ahead and mock my name. But my love for you will be the same. Go ahead, go ahead and bury me, for very soon I will be free, cause I'll rise again, there's no power on earth can tie me down, yes I'll Go ahead, say that I'm dead and gone, but you will see that you were wrong. Go ahead, try to hide the sun, but all will see that I My children home come to take my people back. Thank you so much, Brother Guy. What a Powerful way to have worship and to begin uh, this week for me in Passion Week. You've already started Sunday night and last night and then going to tomorrow. And I'm so proud that you've picked this week uh, to really have a sense of revival and worship and uh, a time uh, for all Christians to come together. And uh, what a beautiful place you have. I am so impressed by what God is doing in your church uh, you are a picture of what God can do in a life that's willing to trust Him even after a storm has come. And uh, what a beautiful church building you have in campus. And I've been following your story uh, through uh, Dr. Bill Hurt. Uh, you are blessed. It's said of pastors uh, that they have three main responsibilities. Uh, a visionary leader, an effective communicator of the gospel, as well as the heart of a shepherd care for his people. Rarely do you find a pastor that uh, excels at any two or of the three. Uh, you were blessed to have one of our men in the state of Mississippi that excels in all three areas of a great pastor. 
And uh, he loves you. He brags on you. He's been a friend to me, and uh, he's been a friend to you. And uh, it's my honor to be here for us to look together. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something for me tonight. I want you to open up your heart. I want you to come with me on a road that our master walked for you and for me tonight. I need you to go ahead and do that now. Don't wait. I want you just to start with me, okay? Tonight I've been given the passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 23, 26 through 31, the message, Cries of Weeping. I don't have any funny stories to tell you. Um, this passage is going to require us to ask God, Lord, what do you, what do you want to speak to my heart tonight about? Uh, and I want to begin the week, and I want us to see some passages of Scripture in Luke 19 and then in chapter 23. You can follow in your passage of the, uh, uh, the, the Word of God, your copy of God's Word, or you can look at the screen and you can see the, uh, the words there as well. You see, this week began in tears. Jesus comes in, what we know as the triumphal entry, it doesn't look like much of a triumph, but he comes in and he stops and sees Jerusalem, and the Bible says he wept. Then as we come to tonight's passage, we come to near the end of the week, the last time he will walk out of the city gates of Jerusalem, heading to the cross, before his crucifixion, and there Jerusalem is weeping for him. So tonight, as we look at these passages of Scripture, uh, tears. It's a hard thing to, to explain tears. My father... I only saw him cry one time. I, I'm 55 years old, and the 55 years I've known him, now obviously the first few years I don't remember much, but, but all these years, I've only seen my father cry one time. I was about 10 years old. He asked my sister and myself to go to my room. We did. He came in. He said, I want to tell you something. And then he started crying. I saw tears come out of my dad's eyes. He said, Granny passed away. She died. His mother, our grandmother, who we call Granny. That's the first time I saw him cry. It's the last time I've ever seen my father cry. I've had dear friends of my church, men, men who were on boards of major companies that you would know the name of those companies. They traveled around the world. But I could not ask them to stand in a pulpit and talk about their family, how much they love their family, how much they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they could not do it. Now, one-on-one, -on -one, they could talk to you all day long about the Lord and about their family, but they could not stand up because the moment they mentioned Jesus' name, tears would just roll out of their eyes. They couldn't do it. They were that tender-hearted. I don't know where you are on the spectrum today, but that that moment we encounter these passages of Scripture, when we think about Calvary, when we think about resurrection, it ought to touch your heart. It ought to not be just another religious experience. God, save us from that. Help us walk with the Lord and understand. So tonight, I want you to see this first passage of Scripture because it was a week of tears. A week of tears. Let's look together at Luke chapter 19. Beginning in verse 37, you'll see the triumphal entry. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Don't let that pass you by. 
he saw the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says Jesus began to weep over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially, in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children with in you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation it was a week it was a week of tears it began that way a few weeks ago I had the privilege of taking some of my people to Israel and this is a picture just from February the middle of February this is the road, the path upon which the path that Jesus would have walked down the descent of the Mount of Olives as he's overlooking uh, Jerusalem. This is the pathway Jesus would have ridden on that donkey. Now, we call it the triumphal entry, but he, was, he wasn't on a stallion. He wasn't some great conqueror coming in. That's what they wanted. That's what they were crying. But notice this next picture. Some years ago, last century, they built a church at the place, tradition says, Jesus stopped and wept. Now look at this church building. Do you notice the shape? It's the shape of a tear. Dominus Levit, the Lord wept. And notice in each corner and at the top, there are vessels representing containers that, that stored the tears of our Lord. Now, obviously, it's symbolic, but it's there in that very area where Jesus saw this next picture. Now, this is the city of Jerusalem. This is the Kidron Valley. This is the eastern wall. You see the eastern gate. Obviously, there are some things there that weren't there in the first century, but that wall was there. That Kidron Valley was there, and Jesus would have crossed over a bridge that was on the northern end and entered into the Sheep Gate, which is now known as the Lion's Gate, entered into the city, and they were crying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were waving the palm branches. They were laying down their clothes on the road for his, his colt to walk over. They were treating him as a king, and while they were exalting him as some earthly king, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was weeping. Such an odd contrast. He is crying for Jerusalem. When I was preparing this message, last week we were in what we called a, uh, a ministry event to nine schools, high schools and junior high in our community. We brought in a speaker who has spoken to over 3,000 high school assemblies. You don't find many of those guys around. But God has used his testimony and used his ministry. And on Wednesday night, we invited all those students to come to our church. We had over 700 students show up on a Wednesday night. But he went to all these campuses and he was discussing three things. He was talking to them about forgiveness. He said, if you've ever been hurt and you've not forgiven, you need to forgive. He said, some of you have felt the harsh reality of rejection. You may go back, he said, and he dealt with that out of his testimony. But then he said, the reason I've come here is to get to a serious, serious subject. He said, in the last 10 years in America, teenage suicide has increased 70%. And we don't know why. We have some theories but it's hitting our schools and our campuses. And he started to minister to those people. I'm telling you, you could hear a pin drop. Hundreds of students. In one county school, everybody in that school knows everybody. Lincoln County, probably half of them are related somehow. Small county school. And after it was all over, we had ministers, the school counselor, we had people who had gone through training just to talk to students who might want to talk. And of course, all of them left. They all walked out, went to class, not one stayed. And I was watching, I was looking. Well then, guess what? 
I turned back to the, to the bleachers, and there was one young man, broad-shouldered, athletic, and he was bent straight over, motionless. It was as if somebody had welded him to those bleachers. And I started to walk toward him, and a, another minister walked up into the stands and literally just sat right next to him. And as I got closer to him, I realized there was one thing moving in his body, and it was his cheeks. They were quivering, and tears were flowing down his eyes, off his cheeks, just dripping off of his chin. He stayed that way for minutes, would not move. It was as if the weight of the world had been placed on his shoulders. Now, he had a very difficult story. And what that gentleman that we brought touched his heart, and we were able to minister to him. The heaviness of our broken world is sitting on people's shoulders. And why? This world is broken because of our selfishness, our sin, our pride, our ego. We think we don't need God. Our world thinks they can do what they want to do. Even in our heart, we have that sin that, that just continues to reek and battle in within us and the weights fall down. It was a week of tears. It was not only a week of tears, it was a week of warning. In this passage, as well as the one we're going to look at tonight, Jesus has a warning for us. Look at Luke chapter 23. This is the passage we're going to look at. Jesus is leaving the city. He's exited out of the Damascus gate. He's taken a right, and there this this. Luke writes in uh, the 23rd chapter, beginning in verse uh, 26, Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it, note these words, after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will they do in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. It was not only a week of tears, the Passion Week, it was a week of warning. Now imagine this scene. Jesus is going, he's been scourged. The Bible says that, the, that Pilate three times tried to convince the angry mob and the, the religious leaders who had sought to bring this all about, to do away with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to try to let him go. He offered a, another criminal in his place. He scourges him. He, he tries to assuage the anger of this mob and says, this man is innocent, this man is innocent, this man is innocent. Even Luke says he, he just turns them over, he turns Jesus over to them. He never ever proclaims that Jesus is guilty of anything because he's not. He was scourged. Now this was done by the Romans. The Jews would beat someone 40 times. That was the limit. They actually did it less one just to make sure they didn't break the law. They did it 39 times. 40 save one. They were that legalistic in the way they beat people up. Paul endured that. The Romans may have done the same thing 40 times minus 1. They may have done that, but more than likely, uh, they did it their way, and they did it with a cat of nine tails, a whip. They took that leather whip that had numerous strands of leather that had pieces of sharp bone and pieces of sharp metal at the end, and they would tie the person up to a post and then specialists of the Roman guard would come 
and whip and scourge with that cat of nine tails. Now, they would do it as long as they wanted to do it. There was really no limit for the Romans. And such specialists were they in torture that they could take and rip the flesh off of the one being tortured without ever injuring the vital organs. Why? Because that's what crucifixion was for, was for death. This was torture. And that's what they did to our Lord and Savior. The view of him was one of a bloodied, beaten skeleton of a man. And the Bible says he was carrying his cross. Now the post would have been set in the ground at the base of Calvary, at the, the place of the skull, Golgotha. But the cross beam was made to be carried by the one found guilty, the criminal. And Jesus, the innocent one, each carrying their cross beam. Now he is weakened. He is beaten. He is scourged. He's been in a pit the night before. He has been mocked. And here our Lord is carrying through the city streets this cross beam. And what are we seeing? Someone who begins to stumble and falter. The Romans pick a man named Simon. We'll talk about him in just a minute from Cyrene. But also are these women. Now these are not, it's not Mary. It's not Mary of Magdala. It, it's not uh, Salome. It's not the mother of Jesus. That's not the women that's being referred to here. These are the local women. These are the daughters of Jerusalem. It's, it's persecution day. It's, it's a... It's, court and execution and it's a public scene and these women are the public mourners they're weeping and wailing they're offering him a drink of some type of opiate that might lessen the pain they they are acting as a agents of mercy but you my friend would do the same if you saw what they saw you would be moved to tears too. But note, their response is a human emotional response. It's the same thing you would have if you saw the beaten, bloodied body of Jesus. Your heart would be, I don't care if you've only cried once in your life, you would cry again. But it was a human response. And Jesus turns to them. Just like he had said when he saw Jerusalem on Sunday in the triumphal entry into the city, now leaving the city, he stops and turns to them and says, don't cry for me. Save those tears. Cry for yourself. For if the Romans were to do this to an innocent man, a green branch, full of life, a righteous branch. Imagine what they will do to the guilty, to the dry, with no life. And indeed, those warnings came true. One generation later, the Romans came down upon Jerusalem and they burnt it down to the ground. They took the great stones of the Temple Mount that Herod the Great had, had expanded and built and tumbled them down. I'm telling you, my friend, I saw those same stones last month. They're still there. They're at the base of that Temple Mount. Those great stones were just literally just pushed over. The exact warning came true. Here today, we realize that this shocking view of our Lord and Savior, this weeping that is done there, friend, I, I believe Jesus still weeps. I believe you can still grieve the Holy Spirit with our pride and our sin, our heartlessness, our lack of love. But I'm not here today. I'm not here today to tell you that the judgment is the final word on this passage. 
You see, I don't preach the gospel to tell bad news. I preach the gospel to tell the real news and then the good news. <laughs> I want to tell you tonight, Passion Week was a week of tears. Passion Week is a week of warning, a true warning to the self-righteous, a true warning to the rebellious, a true warning that says you are religious but you don't know God. You have your rules, you have your customs, you've written me right out of your life and replaced me with your own stuff. And judgment is coming. There is a, it is a week of warning. But I'm telling you, my friend, it's also a week of hope. Because in this passage of Scripture is a man named Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is a city in Libya west of Egypt. He was a Jew. Jews spread out all over that part of the world, but their custom was at least once in their life they had to make a pilgrimage to the temple, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem during one of the three pilgrimage feasts. And so here it is, Passover, and he's made it to Jerusalem. Perhaps he spent the night in Bethany like Jesus did and is coming over the Mount of Olives. He's entering to the city and there he is and the Romans, the Bible says, literally fingered him, laid their hands on him as they could do and ask you to do and tell you whatever you carry my backpack. Jesus said if they ask you to do that, carry it two miles, not just one mile. They could do anything. They put their hands on this Simon fellow and said, here, take the cross. Now, my friend, that wasn't a piece of lumber from your local lumber store. Jesus had carried that cross beam. What was on it? His blood. What was in the crevices of that beam? His flesh. And Simon had to pick that up and carry it. And Luke says very specifically as we read it, and he followed after him. Simon is looking at what his sin did. No sacrifice he would ever give could pay the price that Jesus was about to pay on Calvary's cross. Simon, I want you to see this passage of Scripture. Did it affect Simon? We believe so. Now, we can't say for absolute certainty, but there is something interesting in Mark's gospel. Mark tells this story. Luke's first audience probably did not know what Mark's audience knew. And when Mark wrote it, he said, then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian. Okay, Luke told us the same thing, but notice the next phrase. Mark says, oh, you know this guy. He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. When you go to Romans 16, 13, you find there Paul saying, hey, Rufus greets you, the church. We believe that Simon was so moved by that experience that he comes to faith in Christ, influences his wife, influences his sons, and his sons become leaders in the church. You see, his heart was changed. Notice this next passage of Scripture. There's a difference in the kind of tears that you cry. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Corinth was as mixed up as any church could be. They were split up. They, did, they couldn't spell the word unity. They were in each little pocket of groups and one like this teacher and one like that teacher and then the super spiritual said well we're we're in the Jesus Bible study class I mean it was just everybody was at each other they they had no courtesy for one another there was immorality going in the church everybody knew it and they covered up and wouldn't even talk about it and Paul had to write at least three letters maybe four letters back and forth to this church because they were constantly at each other and he writes this passage and he says now I rejoice, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 7, 9, and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, not, not that it hurt you, 
but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Do you see that? It says here that there is a godly sorrow. Oh, there are people who weep. There are people who are sorry. Uh, They can be moved if they see a, a movie about the cross. But they're not moved about their own condition. They need to see why Jesus went to the cross. And it needs to move them to have a sorrow for their own sin. The truth is, the Romans didn't put Jesus on that cross. The Jews didn't put Jesus on that cross. My friend, you're looking at the person who put Jesus on that cross. And he willingly laid down. Jesus said, no one can put me on that cross. I willingly lay down my life. You see, the sins, my sin. Your sins, the sins of the world. Jesus died for us. And that ought to touch your heart to the point to say, Oh God, forgive me of my sin. Hear my cry. Because that godly sorrow changes everything. It says it leads to repentance. What's repentance? Change of mind. That's literally what it means. It means to change how you see things. A 180 degree change. It changes what you worship. It changes what you love. It changes what you want to do. It changes how you want to live. It changes how you speak to people. It changes how you spend your money. It changes everything about you. It changes you and says, no longer will I serve me. I will serve him. My life is forever That's what repentance does. And the Bible says when you do that, godly sorrow, oh God, forgive me, my sin. It changes how we see him. He is Lord. I'm not king. He's the only king. And then what it it leads to salvation. You know what salvation is? To be saved. The word means to be made whole. It means to be rescued and brought back. You see, we're separated from God in our sin, but when we're saved, we're brought back and made whole in relationship with Jesus, with God our Creator. That's what it means to be saved. Dear friends, tonight we come here and I want to tell you something. I want you to know that tonight there ought to be some tears. Now, they may not spill out of your eyes like my dad. My dad is a very compassionate, loving person. Now, when I was a teenager, he was hard. (laughs) We didn't have the greatest relationship during the teenage, not because of his fault, because I was so, let me put it this way, I was not as respectful as I should have been for the man who was paying for everything I had. He's my best friend today. Oh, he has a tender heart, but he's he's not one to cry out with you. I'm not talking about an emotional response. The daughters of Jerusalem, we don't need that. But what we do need is godly sorrow on the inside. And so what, or should I say, who are you crying for? You may be like Jesus going into Jerusalem, and you see the world and the hurt and the pain, and it moves you to tears, and it moves you to do something about it. Jesus didn't stay on that triumphal entry road. He went on to the Via Dolorosa. He walked all the way to the cross for us. He was moved to tears, but then he did something about it to save the world. You and I may cry for that neighbor down the street, that family, that that teenager who's who's being shuffled all over the place because their family is broken up every which way you can break a family up. And it it hurts you, and you're going to be moved to do something. 
about it. But perhaps the person you need to weep for tonight is not someone else, it's you. I've got good news for you today. If you weep tears here for your sin, godly sorrow that leads you to a change of life by the power of Jesus, I want you to read this passage of Scripture. One day, there, forever, you'll never cry again. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. My friend, that's good news. If we cry here over our sins, We'll never have to cry there over our sin. But if you will not humble yourself, if you will not open your heart and see that Jesus came to die for you and you're unwilling to cry godly sorrow here, the Bible says one day in all eternity you'll cry there. For there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. That is an eternity of tears. Where will you cry? Friend, be moved. Don't be hard-hearted. See Jesus. See Jesus. Don't let this just be an emotional response. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never said, oh God, forgive me of my sin, my sin, put the whip on your back, my sin sent you to the cross. But on the third day, oh God, I believe Jesus was raised again, victorious, has forgiven every sin, defeated every death, lives forevermore, loves me, never will stop loving me. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. And in heaven, you'll never cry again. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, our mighty God, we come before you today. I ask, Lord, that you do your holy work in our lives. But the bill will come this past week. We'll sing. Father, for some of us, it may be a commitment time. Lord, I need to open my heart. I need to be moved to tears again, but I know you as Savior and Lord, but I need to be moved to see the condition of my world and then to do something for you to tell the good news. Perhaps there's someone here there may be a Simon right here that needs you tonight. May they come and take the pastor by the hand and say, tonight's my night. I'm ready to receive Jesus and his forgiveness and to be saved. Father, have your way. Your name be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you please stand? Let's sing, sing from your heart, and you come, you come tonight as the Lord leads you. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing. Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee for Thine in Thine atonement. Didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall. I 
give henceforth to.